why didn't I think of it? What? The people in our simulation model think their world is the only real one. So? Who says this isn't also a computer? You, me, all of us, just electronic circuits. Identity unit 3,124,000, named Han. How does that sound? Drunk. Welcome to the Magic Lantern Podcast, an ongoing informal discussion of the films we love and the things we love about them. I am Erica Long. And I am Cole Rolaine. Each episode of the Magic Lantern will be devoted to one film that we alternately select and we will discuss why it is significant to us. Just a note, whether the film is a classic or a more contemporary title, this will be an in-depth discussion that will include explicit plot details and potential spoilers. We are at episode 127, back to Cole's choice. What are we discussing today? Well, I thought your choice of The Matrix was kind of inspired, and I wanted to pick something that would go along with that, that would complement it, that we could do compare and contrast with a little bit. So I chose World on a Wire from 1973, directed by Rainer Werner Fassbinder, and starring Klaus Lovitch, Masha Robin, Karl-Heinz Vosko-Rau, Adrian Hoven, Ivan Desny, Barbara Valentine, Gunter Lamprecht, Margaret Karstensen, Gottfried John, Kurt Robb, El Hedi Ben Salim, Uli Lomel, and Ingrid Coven. I mentioned so many names this time because so many of these performers collaborated with him so often that I feel like their contributions are integral to understanding his body of work. Kurt Robb made 31 projects with him, for instance. His familiarity with his stock company in front of and behind the camera, let's say, that was probably at least partially responsible for enabling the outlandish pace at which he worked. Pharmaceuticals probably enabled the rest. And another reason that I want to mention them right up top and their contributions is because a number of them are intertwined inextricably with Fassbender's personal life as well. His stock company was made up largely of people he routinely worked with, did drugs with or had sex with consecutively and or concurrently. It was a messy and chaotic career in life that produced a number of masterpieces, including this one. World on a Wire was originally a two-part miniseries for German television based on the novel Simulacron 3 by Daniel F. Galouye, and it's about a cybernetics engineer who begins observing odd phenomena in the computer-generated virtual reality program that he oversees which then causes him to question the veracity of reality itself. Now, I would have expected you after that to say he lived to the ripe old age of 102. <laughs> oh, no. No. He died very young. He was just 27 at the time that he made this. And this was his 20th film at that point, if we include shorts and television work. And this film they made in an astounding 44 days. Do you remember how you came to this film? Well, I'd heard about it for quite a few years before I saw it, but my first opportunity to actually watch it, I saw this just before we first met in the late summer of 2012 at the Paramount Theater. Which makes me wonder now, are you my Ava come to save me from the simulation that I was in prior to this? You bet. I was really lucky to have my first experience with it be on the big screen. It's a lot to take in in one sitting, though. But in retrospect, I really like that. Since so much of it is about ratcheting up the paranoia, I liked that I had to consume it all at once instead of being given a breather. It made that aspect of it feel a lot more relentless. Now, in preparation for this episode, we watched it as it was originally broadcast in two parts. Are you glad that we did it that way? Was it more fun to have that little cliffhanger at the end of part one, for example? Yes, I think it was. And this was my first Fassbender, so thank you. And you know that I hate cliffhangers, but I was kind of prepared for this one, so it didn't give me such a high level of anxiety, which I don't appreciate. So I think I was able to just really enjoy it. And we didn't make you wait too long. It was only the next evening, so you only had to go less than 24 hours in between. Absolutely. Well, let's get right into it. The first thing that strikes me is that this full-frame presentation is the perfect aspect ratio for this. We're boxed in, we've got screens within screens within screens, and then you have these droning, ominous vocals in the background. It is a new German cinema feeling right away. 
It's futuristic in that funky 70s German sort of style. It's not a great looking film in the typical sense, but it has a specific aesthetic, sort of like Alphaville does. And maybe futuristic isn't even the right word. I want to see what you think about this, but I think maybe more state of the art is the phrase than futuristic. It is at the cutting edge of right then in the present. It gives us an idea of where we might be headed in the future, and that place is a little ugly, it seems like. It's still, though, unique enough to be compelling and make you want to get to where we're headed. If the movie were a person, though, I was thinking, they wouldn't necessarily be conventionally handsome in the traditional sense, but their face would be one that you find you keep thinking about. Much like many of Fassbender's collaborators. Mm -hmm, Exactly. And then the kitschiness of it, it certainly underlines how much state-of-the-art is often not very far from tacky and cheap. Sometimes that margin is razor thin. It's obviously a completely different approach, having just come off of The Matrix, for example. But visually, and then especially with practical effects, are you acutely aware of the visuals and the difference that 20 years makes with those special effects? I am, and I was. I felt like I was dropped into the state, and I mean that in capital letters, right away. The... Comedy troupe with Thomas Lennon. And... No, the other one. <laughs> <laughs> the one you would have known watching from your West German television. It sort of feels like the conversation a little bit to me, if you catch my meaning. And the camera is doing odd and interesting things, standing behind people so you're sort of catching hands or gestures. It's like it knows something that you don't, which is what one of our characters says planting the seed a little bit for the eventual reveal that this is a simulation and is constantly being observed, maybe? Spoiler alert. <laughs> I put that at the beginning. You did. So. I just think there's a lot of visual and sonic interest right away, too. It looks like there's some distortion happening, almost as if it's heat, but it's snowing outside. It's such a weird, off-putting feeling, like something isn't true to life. Well, you're not the only one that has that feeling. Our protagonist, one Fred Stiller, I think he has a ton of that gnawing away at him. His character, he's the one who becomes the technical director of this institute that houses this supercomputer. And he feels out of time to me as a viewer as well. He feels like a sort of throwback, almost like a little fireplug James Bond character. Our introduction to him has a neo-noir feeling to me, for example. Can you imagine... An early 50s Cold War version of this film with Charles McGraw as Stiller. I think that's great. I also thought a lot about James Cagney. Mm -hmm. A little tough guy. Yeah. You slap this in right after the narrow margin and it would be incredible, I think. But one of the first things that we learn about him is that there's a rumor going around that Stiller has created an artificial world, which I love how that ties in specifically with Fassbender's worldview, even though this is his only science fiction film. Everything with him is always about people and the systems that control them. So it's a great choice for him to adapt. It seems like a natural pairing. Now there's a Dr. Vollmer, who is Stiller's predecessor in this job, and he is being very confrontational in a meeting in the opening scenes. He's going on and on about perception until he is taken away. Is he crazy, or does he just know everything and it's too much for him? Well, he's trying to say that all is not right with this simulacron, which is this created world. And he's saying that this problem would mean the end of this world. Pay attention to the wording. Something we're also introduced to in these opening scenes, the most striking aspect of the set design, in fact, it begins here and it never stops. It's these mirrors everywhere. There may not be enough mirrors in the world to deal with or represent how much of this is about layer upon layer of imitation and copying. And it's not just mirrors. You have monitors, reflective desktops, video phones as well. It's just a massive feedback loop that is reflecting and distorting our perception of ourselves. And I don't know if you did this too, but I think Fassbender is a genius at camouflaging his cameras with so many around. Since I'd seen it before, I took a moment or two to specifically look to see if I could catch any of them, and I didn't see a single camera anywhere. Again, being a newbie to the world of Fassbender, I didn't realize that he found a lot of inspiration, especially for the mirror motifs, from the films of Douglas Sirk. 
And at one point, Douglas Sirk said that the mirror is the imitation of life. What is interesting about a mirror is that it does not show yourself as you are. It shows you your own opposite. So again, it seems perfect for this film. Yeah, that's a great quote from Sirk. And I was thinking about this as we went into it. If the mirrors would be too much, if it would take you out of the film, overloading it with that aspect of the production design. But I love that element that you specifically mentioned there, that our reflection, that's what he's exploiting. It suits this material so perfectly. I think if anybody has a problem with one too many mirrors, just don't continue watching the film because it is designed with an inch of its life. There's so much happening. Yeah, I guess we could recommend it if you are extremely vain. You'll probably be right at home with it. But like I was saying, it suits the material perfectly. The fact that a reflection is not us, but a reversal, it's flipped. It's this beautiful contradiction of how the main source of our own self-image is exactly the opposite of how we appear to everyone else. And that's obviously a big idea to try to deal with, just to take in. And Vollmer's head is full of that and infinitely more, probably. His head seems like it is on the verge of exploding. He's the classic scientist cursed with knowledge, pushing him to the brink of madness. What makes it hard for him, I think, is that no one else is even equipped to deal with what he has stumbled upon. He likens this knowledge to a kid's game. He has to dumb it down so that he can even at least be partially understood. Now, being as we had just finished The Matrix prior to this, I'll probably be doing a whole lot of comparing and contrasting. Since that film is still so much on my mind, what occurs to me here... Volmer is no Morpheus. Volmer is terrified and overloaded by the truth. And in fact, no one seems prepared for anything that's happening here. Gunther Lauza, the security advisor at the Institute, he disappears. These bodyguards that are constantly following Stiller, they are menacing, but it seems like they can hardly keep up with him. It's child's play for him to outwit them. Stiller is not even really that thrilled at being promoted, but he can't resist the lure of the simulacron. He meets Volmer's daughter, Ava, and she has that classic femme fatale edge that makes you constantly question her motivations and how much she knows. Volmer's sketches and formulas disappear right before our very eyes. We, the audience, aren't even ready. I think the first time that occurred to me is when we're at that house party of Lauzas who will actually start to disappear here in a moment. The swimming pool party, that one? Yes, and it's not the disappearance of Lauza, it's just that set piece of the party. As everyone is talking about whether the people in the simulation are people or not, or they're just identity units, just circuits, while the people at the party, ostensibly the real people, quote-unquote, are unnatural statues, completely still, standing at odd angles to each other. This, to me, really encapsulated that vibrating, weird, stylistic oddness of everything and everyone. I think it's at that party where I first become aware of Stiller's penchant for circling things, for making these loops, for pacing around the perimeter of a room, for instance. It reminds me a little of Fellini's Lestrada when Anthony Quinn is making those sorts of motions. And it all sort of ties together because we have Zeno's paradox that comes into play. Volmer is rambling about philosophy. And by the time we get to the end, we will see very clearly how all of these things are at least metaphorically looped. I like how philosophy is approached here more than the Matrix, I should say. We might get to some of those same questions, for instance, whom do you trust? Can an assemblage of data ever approximate a human consciousness, no matter how comprehensive it is? Can these men trust their own perceptions? But it nudges us to get there. It doesn't point directly at anything. It's more subtle than the Matrix. So then to the question that you asked in that episode, I'm going to ask here, does this film surpass its philosophy 101 underpinnings? Because we talk about Plato and Aristotle, and again, the parable of Achilles and the tortoise. Those are discussions that you could imagine happening at any university at any point. That's true, but the way they're presented here, it seems much more like they're in the margins. They're not the central conceit. They're more that thing, that grotesque, that's going to ambush Stiller out of the corner of his eye, rather than sitting down and having that conversation in the dorm at 3 a.m. 
The way you just described it then makes me think about musicals, if it sort of feels like it's furthering the story as opposed to everyone stop while I go into a soft shoe routine. That is a great distinction to make because this very definitely feels organic. It is part of the evolution of the film. Again, always better when you don't even know that you're being told these things and then later it occurs to you. By the time everything is being summed up, all of those pieces fall into place. Well, speaking of falling into place, Stiller has some special knowledge and clearly someone or something is out to get him because there's a load of stones being carried, dropped, clearly meant for him, and they kill a woman instead, but he just keeps going. Yeah, he's strangely not phased by that. He stops to actually retrieve a cigarette lighter, I think, from her mangled, crushed body and then is on his way. Working at the Institute, I don't think it breeds empathy in a lot of people. Because we see that, for instance, in Siskins, the head of the Institute. He is a creep. That just seems like it's always going to be a given, though. Do you ever hear the phrase, the head of the Institute, and then picture that as a nice, honest person? Definitely not. It might as well be the head of the Institute <laughs> in this case. And this is also the first interaction that they have with the press. And I really am interested in the way the media is portrayed here. Because eventually what is revealed is that they are the most corruptible and the least heroic when afforded the opportunity to be noble. No one is surprised by industrialists looking after their own interests with such fervor, but with respect to potential with what is and what could be, I am most disappointed by these reporters' lack of meaningful action, if not outright complicity in the evil that is afoot here. And I think that letdown contributes to some of the most acute feelings of paranoia that the film generates in me and all these swirling questions that I have. Who benefits from these technological advances? What role is the media supposed to play? I come from a long line of all the president's men, so I'm approaching this from a very specific angle. Which came after this, very importantly, and they're not Woodward and Bernstein. It's not the fourth estate, no. I think, of the way that we tend to think of it. Right. I default to think that they're supposed to be advocating for us all the time. And so that leads me to the most paranoid question of all. Does it even matter if there's nothing we can do about it? Because some of them are asking questions, but if there's a snack involved, they're easily <laughs> diverted to that. We do learn later that there are costly investments here that will be affected by the program, and the stakes are very high. And one of the things that I just loved here in that particular meeting, Stiller goes to the trouble of going through four sets of doors to make his circle where he arrives at the same place where he started and he's still not comfortable. He's never comfortable. Later in the film, Siskins puts Stiller on the spot with the press again regarding the simulation model. It's revealed in that press conference that its purpose is almost to predict the future so that mistakes can be avoided, needs can be predicted, including very significantly ways that can be exploited by industry and lead to dangerous conflicts of interest. Well, I love here how the original purpose, at least as stated by the Institute, is to predict the need of resources decades down the line, which is the most banal thing that you can think of. And that's where all crime comes from, as far as I'm concerned. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that, the banality of that, and how much detail is packed in here. Because I was wondering, did you find this, because of this density of detail, a little more inscrutable than The Matrix? more willfully obtuse in some way or another, and especially thinking of it as two different episodes, a part one and a part two, did one of those two individual episodes have more of that than the other? For instance, this world building has to be kind of dense, and then in part two, we get to the chase, essentially. I didn't find it obtuse at all, and it does seem like both of them try to take pains to speak their subtext, at least to some degree you talked about kind of the, how they're handled differently in both. Is it because as a viewer, I'm particularly more accustomed to taking something new and ostensibly kind of art house at face value and just sort of go with it? That I've watched many other things like this, both before and after, so it doesn't seem particularly outré to me. I don't really have a clear answer for you, but just like with that pool party, I was just along for the ride. And as I was going, trying to clock things in my mind, track specific ideas that I was interested in following, but never at any point feeling like I needed to throw up my hands that I just couldn't figure out what was happening. 
For me, I don't think it's as much an issue of being difficult to understand as it is it intentionally is trying to keep you off balance. It's menacing, but in a very particular way, just aesthetically. And I think that is just part and parcel of Fassbender's style. Just aesthetically, it's doing a lot of things that you recognize, but it's making moves that aren't familiar in that process, in settings that feel unfamiliar. And I think in this case, your ability to deal with sensory overload will dictate how easy it is for you to go along through the film. And speaking of sensory overload, I love this scene when Stiller first asks to be hooked up to the simulacron. It's the opposite of the Matrix. People actually desire to be hooked into this simulation. That's the escape. His first attempt has to be postponed because the police show up. While we're talking about that, is it distressing or comforting to you that no matter the technology or the year, homicide cops apparently never change? At least in the movies. I think it's comforting. We've talked a lot about this throwback aspect. And what you were talking about a moment ago made me think about Elizabeth Scott performances where I don't think she was specifically directed to act like she was sleepwalking, but that's a naturalness in its own way that we're used to. Well, when Stiller actually gets to be hooked up to this machine, this great detail appears where he is aware within the program. It's almost like a lucid dream rather than a simulation that he's being put through. Something goes wrong as he's driving this truck. Listen, all y'all, it's a sabotage, basically. This graphic comes up and it flashes like a warning, but it translates to, I think, something just slightly gentler than that. It means come back or even idiomatically circle back, return, which fits right in with our loop metaphor. And I think it's also a little bit gentler than the warning the way is portrayed when it flashes up in front of his eyes. So I guess chalk that up to the inherent tenderness of the German language. Right. It could have said Achtung 50 times, but yes. And speaking of German tenderness, this being your first experience with Fassbender, what do you make of all of these icy, Teutonic, slightly gap-toothed women staring off into the middle distance? It even includes a facsimile of the Rosetta Stone for that, Marlena Dietrich. It's fascinating. I was so interested in the women, some of whom, like the glorious Gloria Frohm, who are pretty shady. I was trying to get a clue in watching them from their amazing outfits as to if there was some sort of message being conveyed to me, because a lot of the prominent female characters appear in animal print repeatedly. Gloria Frome does not. Ava does, but much, much later at a specific point. I started to wonder who is real and who is not, which is a good question when you're looking at one of these women staring into the middle distance. Especially Ava, who has this sense of uncanny valley, even when compared to Gloria Frome, who is like Jane Mansfield to the max, but German. Can I say a super quick word here about Barbara Valentine? Yeah, absolutely. Well, there's got to be an MST3K connection in everything that I do. <laughs> and she, in her very first film appearance, was in Horrors of Spider Island, which was lampooned by MST3K. And she was one of his stock players. I found out just earlier this year that she lived with Freddie Mercury in the 80s. Did you know that? Yeah, I did. Where you been? <laughs> Sorry. Kurt Robb was another friend, evidently. Who doesn't want to hang out with Kurt Robb? Everybody needs a super creep hanging around all the time. Looks like he's born to play all of those parts. I can't imagine him as the friendly neighborhood baker. <laughs> Butcher, maybe. Which we'll get to a little bit later. But for now, this detached performance style that you get from all of these women and some of the men as well. This is one of Fassbender's signature devices. I think it's what contributes most to that numbness, that antiseptic coldness that I feel with a lot of his films. And I don't mean that as a negative. I should be clear. He frequently specifically directed them to make a gesture that was intentionally awkward. And I can't imagine that he did a lot of takes so they're not being allowed to get comfortable or relax into these roles, and you really feel that detachment. I do want to also draw the distinction between shooting quickly versus shooting sloppily. He may have shot very quickly, but he had a very specific idea of what it was that he was going for, and he achieved the desired effect most of the time. And you definitely get that feeling, like you mentioned in the beginning, when you are at that swimming pool party, when you're observing anyone that's assembled there. Is there anyone that's not a simulation, is what I was thinking too. 
Now that coldness was something that I brought up to you before we even watched this. And I hate sometimes to plant seeds, but I also like to prepare you for things that I think you might think are fun to look for if you haven't seen the given film that we've chosen. I think of that coldness as a virtue when I watch these movies. It helps me keep a sort of analytical distance as opposed to being wrapped up in it completely with something like John Cassavetes. Did it feel like that to you? Did you even perceive that coldness? Was that an issue at all? Or is that just me? Is that what I get from it? And if you did, did that affect how you approached the film or what you got from it, what you felt about it? I think it did affect how I approached watching it just from what I mentioned in terms of looking for things as clues because it seemed like this world is not my world. So I'm looking for all of these hints that I'm correct. Did it make it harder that they weren't yielding that stuff sometimes? That it was such maybe a struggle to see through the mask that they were projecting? No, maybe I didn't work hard enough. It didn't seem to be <laughs> that big of a deal. But then at the same time, it made me start to look at more of Fassbender's things. Again, I'm a newbie. And so I found this really interesting quote from one of his colleagues about Fassbender not believing in such a thing as being natural. He thought our nature was destroyed in childhood, and this is the point of the film. Nobody's natural. Everybody is an artificial creation. More like Foss baggage, am I right? Goot. <laughs> <laughs> well, Stiller is beginning to show the same symptoms as Volmer. We learn that none of these programmed people, the identity units as they're called, can stand knowing that they are artificial. It actually made one of them attempt suicide. I feel like we could do an entire full-length episode about this single idea, the agony of existence and the lack of relief that comes when it's all revealed to be an illusion. Because just imagine in that world, why would there ever need to be unhappiness or imperfection or an existential ontological emotion? I don't know. Pray about it, maybe, <laughs> and see. Yeah, it's the clockmaker, the watchmaker god, essentially, is what we're talking about here. And here's where we get deep into the philosophy, I think, without, again, being so overt about it. The film doesn't ask these questions outright necessarily, but it makes room for you to find your way to them. Things like, is there more satisfaction in being released from a simulation only if you know it's a simulation? One thing that I like that is similar to The Matrix is that we begin to get these hints that the program itself may be conflicted or corrupted, even secretly self-destructive. This name that's generated by the machine, Christopher Nobody, that's the program sending a clue regarding Zeno's paradox again. It's unnecessarily drawing attention to a detail that could ultimately undo it. And then this impulse, it's personified in Einstein. He is the contact unit. He is the one that knows it's all a fabrication, and he's the interface between those two worlds. I know Vollmer couldn't handle it, but in this case, is Einstein to you more Morpheus or more Oracle? To me, he's Cypher, if anything. Mm. I'm starting to think more and more that Ava performs the Morpheus function. Look at you hitting me with that whole, <laughs> it's not just a binary choice. <laughs> well, let me ask you this then. Which world seemed more dangerous to you? Is it Stiller's world with the constant surveillance? Or is it the simulation that Einstein is in with the more outright threat of violence? Because I found myself really wondering what was underneath what I was feeling about it. Especially this idea being, is our answer to that question the product of growing up with gun culture rather than the specter of secret police hiding around every corner? Good question, because I didn't really think about the danger for either. I thought more about this idea of purgatory, essentially. The thing that bothers me the most well, Einstein knows which one he prefers. He wants to escape the simulation that he's in to get to what he refers to as real life. I want to go back for just a second and talk about this idea of there having to be a contact unit in that world. Because as they're going later on to try to locate people via programming, locating people via characteristics that they have programmed into these identity units, it seems like there are a lot of units that share the same characteristics, like there's only so much to go around, which just seems like this limited imagination on the part of the creator. 
you're just dangling all this stuff out here as bait for me. The whole made in his own image metaphor, all of these things for me to just rip to shreds and I'm not going to fall for it. And then number two, when you look around, do you actually see in the general population a huge variety of characteristics or is everyone generally the same, but with a few idiosyncrasies? I have a little bit of an opinion about that that okay. I was going to bring up later. Okay. Well, I'm going to pull a Matrix slash World on a Wire and grab the phone and get out of here right now. I really like that touch, in fact, that both of them have this mode of transportation. Just before he pulls that ripcord, though, and goes back to his world, Stiller notices he gets a glimpse of Lausa with Einstein. Fassbender is building these little tiny layers of something doesn't add up. And that thing you were just referring to, that's one of my favorite scenes in the whole film, when Stiller goes hunting in the system for Lausa via his characteristics, and he actually turns up. It actually sort of straddles the line between the futuristic and old-fashioned hard-boiled detective work. And then there are old-fashioned responses to it, too. Stiller is warned away from his search. They're laying the groundwork that he's crazy, overworked, that he has a god complex. It's the old time-tested frame job. Now, since we mentioned this is your first experience with him, as we're nearing the halfway point, do you feel like Fassbender is too acquired a taste? Will he always belong to just the art house crowd, or more specifically, just a subset of the art house crowd? Because these were fairly mainstream television events in Germany, but does he only seem so prominent to us because of the circles we travel in? Gosh, I don't know. Maybe? I think it does help to have at least some knowledge of world cinema. I don't think that it's so inaccessible that people in mass would be turned off by it or by him. So you think there's a huge mass market appeal laying dormant, bubbling under for these odd 16 millimeter experiments in alienation from this coked up horn dog? Yes. <laughs> I mean, come on. Then we get that awesome, my favorite scene when they go to the nudie club, he and Gloria. The music is the best in that. And she sort of stroking people as she walks by it's got mass appeal can we talk about the music here oh, for sure. a moment i love the music in this thing music and the sonic elements i guess i put both of those together because it's interesting in the few moments when there's no underscoring because characters get their own sorts of songs that really have nothing to do with what's happening it's sort of like a recital starts taking place somewhere off screen and we hear this odd music playing. And then there's the strange metal distortion that happens that signals that something is not quite right, that someone's trying to get somewhere they don't belong. We hear that shrill, dissonant twanginess in those moments when Fulmer is being driven mad or when Stiller is questioning his reality. And then there's the more traditional music, which is fascinatingly deployed here. Yes, first the music. I think... The folk songs, the standards, the cabaret, I think it is all extremely intentionally, evocatively German. And then that track, Albatross, from the Peter Green era of Fleetwood Mac, it is brilliant how that is used. It feels like a reprieve every time it comes around again. It's so lilting and gentle and it just washes over everything. Its inclusion actually works as more than just accompaniment for me. It leaves me feeling more optimistic about the character's potential outcomes. And you are on the money about the sound effects, too, because I cannot think of a better aural approximation of synapses frying with the effort of processing everything that's happening in your mind when you take on this thing. So Stiller has gone through all of this, and we are now only at the end of part one. And we discover that they got to Stiller's pal Fritz. He's been hijacked by Einstein. And he refers to Fred as identity unit Fred Stiller. This is what Vollmer knew this whole time. This, where we are, is the simulation. End of part one twist. Boom. You said you'd been waiting for this moment, I think, for quite a while up to then. Did you like the way that it was structured and delivered right there? I did. And I especially like how part two then kicks off in a different way. But that proclamation that Einstein is going to get into the real world, we're all thinking, what? But as interestingly to me, some information just before this, there's 
Ava and she and Schiller have been getting closer and closer. And there's this odd insistence here that she loves him. So I'm also thinking about that. What does that all mean? Well, then you had to wait a day to find out. One thing I want to talk about here at this midpoint of the film, I really love how much influences are fun with this in each direction. I like the little ripples that you feel that might have influenced his contemporaries because Stiller at Maya's bedside feels almost like Herzog's Nosferatu, which would come six years later, especially the way that she turns the mirror away from herself. Then there are echoes of the third man when Stiller goes to visit Maya later upon her return. In fact, the whole thing is pitched somewhere between Kafka and Carol Reed often. And we could talk about Alphaville again, because this film was shot in Paris. The whole idea was to capture this look of the future. And I'm thinking as a West German audience member, you know you're not looking at new German architecture because it wasn't changing, but Paris was. They had all these new neighborhoods with big cubes and no gardens and shopping centers, importantly, that they didn't have in Germany. You're right. It's such an odd juxtaposition to look at because when you're in Maya's apartment, it feels completely old world. And so again, maybe we have one of these dichotomies that is the comfort of the past versus the invasion of this brutalist architecture of the future. But while we're talking about it, I want to make sure and underscore we should not underestimate Maya's importance here, as she is the first connection that Stiller attempts to make after finding out that his world is fake. He is retreating to this old world fantasy, is what it essentially turns out to be. And he's not processing any of it very well. He's torn between anger, accepting the revelation, and then this feeling that nothing matters. He tries to tell someone. He meets Han at the bar. Han mocks him for this. There's more of Stiller circling, completing these circuits. His movements, I love. They echo this loop that we are locked in now with moving between, or even just perceiving, reality versus simulation. There's less and less distinction between the two, and he goes around and around each time, arriving at his starting point, a familiar place. He's been here before, but it offers no comfort. At one point in an outdoor scene, he doesn't have any architecture to pace around, so he literally just turns in a circle in place. And when Stiller has to be stationary, the camera circles him. At this point in the movie, I'm thinking, he's the inverse of Neo. Neo was in the Matrix looking for truth, and he was eventually found. Stiller's problem is exactly the opposite. I know the truth. Now, how to convince those that aren't even looking, those that don't want to look? Because how do you go about trying to prove that this is also a simulation? And I love that he starts trying to look for loopholes. Like, we both enjoyed the use of deja vu in The Matrix. Yeah, I love that detail in both films. It's deja vu in The Matrix. It's incomplete data sets that automatically repair themselves in Germany. How German is that? Totally, because... They set about trying to correct these glitches, and this idea is posited that I adore, and also very German, what can't exist doesn't. But in a neat touch, what isn't can be, because Stiller has a programmed a simulated Siskins. You just blew my mind. <laughs> I love this as another throwback move. It plays like a smart detective trying to catch him up to feel out how much he knows about above, not just below. Now, this doesn't establish itself as immediately adversarial as the Matrix does. There's no doubt as to who the enemy is in the Matrix. Here, I think it's a little different. There's industrial skullduggery. The power of the press comes to bear on it. It's not as clear cut. Similar to your what can't exist doesn't, there's another idea that I love right here. For the answers to be useful, you have to know the proper questions. It's the question, Neo. Yeah, exactly. I love this approach. It's like the somewhat left-handed liberation you achieve by just not caring anymore. And since Stiller can't be bothered to deliver what they need at this point, they replace him with Holm. Kurt Robb is such an excellent creep. The mustache is doing at least half of the work, right? Maybe the eyebrows doing the other half? I think just the sweaty sheen of the whole thing is what's doing the work. But I love how it's all coming together here. I think both of us do. It's another classic part, with all these pieces falling into place here, of the paranoid thriller. 
ineffectual allies, and useless proof that you can't do anything with. The headline that was originally in the newspaper regarding Laus's disappearance, the reporter that filed that story, he confirms that Stiller's memory is correct, that that was what was originally printed, but it's too little, too late now? Because they are almost literally coming for him with a butterfly net. And here's where it really gets fun, I think, with him on the run. Did you feel your adrenaline kick in when they started to pick up the pace here? Yeah, with the breaking down, everything's starting to accelerate. It doesn't help that his car is conspicuous. Like Siskin said, it tells you a lot about a person. Meanwhile, all Han is doing is making out with anything that has a pulse. There's a strike devoted to reinstating Stiller and proving his innocence. None of this matters, though. There is clearly no going back to where we were after everything that's happened. Han drives his car into the drink while Stiller is still on the phone with Ava. The crowd, somehow, curiously recognizes Stiller as a murderer now. Have they been programmed to know that? Because he has been set up all along to be Fulmer's killer. But Stiller escapes. But it leaves you asking, why are they after him on a deeper level? Not just what is he accused of, but why all this trouble over one single identity unit? What makes him dangerous? Is it because he's right or because he's crazy? And going back again to how can resource management possibly kill a person? Well, if he is in the machine and there is someone above, then they're watching every move of his escape on a screen somewhere, you can assume. He's likely constantly being observed, and since he has done this job, he must inherently know that. So why even fight? Why run? Here's my take on that. I especially love that moment when he goes back to Ava's house and it's almost like we're watching him on closed circuit TV, which is what this simulated world looks like. We've seen inside that computer room a few times, but we've also been told that at least at some point it was not manned. So it makes me think there's just got to be people bored <laughs> with monitoring all of these people, upward of 10,000 identity units. And so people have to take a lunch break sometime. Right. Do you think any of these observers are benign? Or at least that they're just indifferent, for example? I do. I think it's just a job to some people. But for some, it should supersede that, I would think. Why don't the cops, for instance, pick him up in the cabaret after this frenetic chase? Is it just programming? I think again about that lack of imagination. They don't have the complete circuitry to really understand this is where we should be going. They haven't seen all of those movies. They don't really know how to track it. Sort of this is the information I'm being presented with now. At some point, some piece will fill in and I'll know what I'm supposed to do. Well, he is able to make good his escape. And he finally makes it back to the cabin where he was when everything began to happen to Volmer. He is officially a wanted man. It's on every radio and television. And Ava arrives, which is suspicious. And ultimately, everything goes haywire and the cabin explodes. He has nowhere left to go. Well, she's about to reveal everything. And I swear that place that he ends up looks like the retirement home from Chinatown. <laughs> but she's come to him again, this time with a gun. She explains the truth, which is that essentially he has become too intelligent. Yeah, she is the first within this simulation to acknowledge the totality of what's above, if you don't count Einstein's defection. And she brings me back to exactly what I was thinking about earlier. She gives that answer that I was waiting for. When I ask what damage can he do as a self-aware identity unit, is one person enough to alter the simulation that significantly? And again, whose interests are being protected in this whole thing? As it turns out, he could cause his world to be deleted. And that's not specifically inherently because of his actions. It has more to do with the actions of the people who are running the simulation above. God complexes again, human emotion. But then you've got those weird windows of time also that you were mentioning earlier where they are unobserved. In this universe, apparently even God knocks off at five o'clock. I am fascinated by the layers of these simulations. Stiller's world, it turns out, it feels to me more noble than the original that it's modeled on. And then his simulation model develops its own simulation model. Is this completely different from, or just a clever twist on, 
how we usually think of AI in movies that becomes homicidally sentient? I think it's a different take because I think it's more about our lives becoming just more banal and we as creations becoming more banal rather than the machine having to murder its creators. Every subsequent iteration of the world can just sand off all the edges until we're all alike. Well, we haven't gotten to that point yet because Stiller returns to the Institute. He's shot. He falls dead. Where does that leave his creator and namesake? Turns out, right here, because Ava has switched their minds at the last minute. Something that is hinted at as a possibility when they restore Einstein to his world. And we're facing another huge philosophical question again. Is it a just punishment here for this operator from above, seeing as how he is at best indifferent and at worst a malevolent creator that took satisfaction in making a simulation that he then put through a series of bewildering and painful indignities? For example, those cinder blocks that you mentioned that were dropped on that woman earlier. In retrospect, now that you know all of this, is it an even more cruel and capricious thing than you initially believed? Well, she's not real. She's still a circuit, so no? But then the flip side of that, it seems to make the real world, which, question mark, seem even more real, and it makes the insistence by Ava that she loves him understandable, because she actually does love the real Stiller, but he let her down. And this creation, this set of circuits, is who she wants to be with. Well, I think then you answer my next question a little bit, because what I was going to ask is, how does all of this then reflect on your perception of our protagonist version of Stiller and his work? Because he treated his creation with considerably more respect, right? Well, I feel like he was pretty insistent from the very beginning about calling them identity units. He never seemed to have an ethical dilemma about it. You don't get emotional about data sets when you're doing mathematics, I guess, right? I don't think so. I don't think he did. But what do you do then when there's the ghost in the machine? Because there is a very specific religious element that's been lurking here all along, which comes into full flower when you are considering the questions raised here in the finale. There are a lot of crosses as a motif throughout the film on walls, in architecture. And now we are down to creator and creation. We have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit of a sort. Even after Volmer's disappearance, he still hangs over the proceedings. We have a crucifixion at the end via machine gun. And then there are just the broader philosophical questions that are left. How can you trust anything to be real? They can just continually pull back to reveal you on a screen over and over and over again. And my example there is probably the most paranoid and cynical way that that could play out. But even if we just take this move from the level we're on to the level above, we come back to Zeno's paradox. Motion is an illusion. Because the simulated world stops when Schiller number one, who's now in Schiller number two's body, dies. But so essentially, are we going to just keep killing God every time well, so that we can exist? <laughs> I know. And when he says, I am, that's the declaration. Yeah, I think you see what I mean here about the philosophical underpinnings of this being deployed a little bit more subtly than you would come across in The Matrix. Now, I haven't read Simulacron 3, have you? No. From what I've read about the film, Fassbender apparently adheres fairly faithfully to it. It isn't as vague, the book, when it comes to delineating real world and simulation. It was written in 1964 and then set in 2034, and predicting the world of 70 years from now just seems like an unimaginable task to me. Especially the way culture seems to change at a geometrically increasing pace. Maybe that's just my imagination or recency bias on my part. Do you think, for example, that things progressed as rapidly from 1985 to 1995 as they have in the last 10 years? It definitely doesn't seem like it, and you can tell my hammer pants that. What's German for it? Can't touch this. <laughs> <laughs> I think the thing that works so well for me with this is the fact that there's very little perceivable difference between the simulation and the reality. As opposed to the Matrix, there's not this huge, shocking disparity between the worlds you occupy when you're plugged in versus being unplugged. It's a more subtle shift, and it makes it 
much more difficult to trust your instincts, to trust what you see. So what do you look for if you're inside the simulation? Because unplugging from the simulacron, it feels much less like a revolutionary act and much more like waking up from a very vivid dream and momentarily not being able to tell the difference. But in the quote unquote real world, world number one, not simulation one or simulation two, they wake up and they have these realistic textiles on and no footwear and she's not in some crazy get up with her hair or makeup. Maybe that's just the style. Maybe one level down, they like film noir that much. So I guess everybody's so. in pinstripe suits. And up above, it's all Jonathan Livingston Seagull. <laughs> yeah, then I look for macrame, I guess. To me, that waking up from a dream versus the huge revolutionary thing, it feels like a much more universal and relatable feeling. It also makes it harder to determine which one of these worlds is preferable, as long as someone is not trying to kill you in one of them. To put it in the parlance of the Matrix, it's not a red pill, blue pill choice. It's more like two purple pills that are slightly different shades. So, which world do you choose? Are you constantly trying to reach whatever level is above? And more importantly, do you ever stop, no matter how satisfied you are with your current level, because there's always that potential for some higher truth? Purgatory again. I search for whichever world does not have Kurt Robb in it. Well, it's definitely a dystopia, but what we didn't talk about with The Matrix, though, is something that I think is more prevalent here, the potential for utopia. In The Matrix, it feels like even winning isn't necessarily that great. It's mostly grim. But this doesn't give me that feeling at all. This feels like that through an evolution of consciousness, you could eventually ascend to a best-of-all-possible-worlds situation. But that leaves us with another question. Does it make the dystopia worse when the same tools that could generate an ideal existence are somehow corrupted by our own human nature. I'm stuck in a little bit of a loop myself because I keep thinking about what if Schiller freed all the minds in the simulation and that just resulted in more attempted suicides. But they can't all be freed because here they're just conceptual. They're not real. They don't all have bodies and minds to hop into. I'm going to ask you a question here. See if you get it. I think my eyes are starting you to cross. One, zero, 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 one, one. Bleep, bleep, one, zero, warp. one, zero, one. Well, bringing it back to this creator himself, we know that Fassbender would never be satisfied. He would eternally be seeking that next level, which is one of the things that I love most about him. His place in the landscape of new German cinema is, again, fascinating to me. German filmmakers of that generation, they grew up in a country that was recently responsible for one of the worst genocides ever perpetrated on the planet. That certainly casts a long shadow. So his inherent distrust of authority, it was likely something that all of his contemporaries shared to one degree or another. In his case, though, the way that manifested itself, he frequently took on subjects that exposed the lingering racism and xenophobia that the upper and middle classes were ineffectively trying to play down. Most often that would be through examination of how power manifests itself on an interpersonal and a geopolitical level. On top of everything else, being bisexual, he focused on LGBTQ issues a great deal. All of this was basically just to make passive, complicit, bourgeois German society face these things that they had done and were still doing head on. Do you have a favorite, Fassbender? Is this it? This is close, but I think I like Ali Ferit's The Soul best of all. But it's hard to choose. And I've only seen a fraction. You know, I say that I've seen 10 or so of his films, which for some filmmakers is an entire lifetime. By the time that he died, he completed 40 feature films, at least two TV series, three short films, four video productions, and 24 plays. Right. And he wrote almost all the screenplays for those. And then he shot, edited, and did art direction for a number of those. He acted in about half of them, and then he acted in projects that his friends directed as well. Can I mention one of his other collaborators sure. for just a second? That's Michael Bauhaus, who is the cinematographer here. He also worked on a number of Scorsese films, Goodfellas, Gangs of New York. He worked with Prince and Madonna as well. And he worked on one of your favorite films as the cinematographer and uncredited director. That's Under the Cherry Moon. <laughs> I believe Bauhaus and Fassbender worked on about 15 films together. 
which cannot have been easy sometimes because Fassbender was the enfant terrible of the new German cinema movement, and he was easily the most prolific of the movement as well. You mentioned his stats. They are staggering when you look at the amount of work that he got done. And that went on for 13 years straight, basically. His first feature film he made in 1969. He was dead by 1982. So for 13 years, it was this breakneck pace until cocaine blew his heart up at age 37. He was a fixture in the German tabloids, obviously. How many muses can the guy have at one time? And a lot of his contemporaries and collaborators, they said, you survived him. You didn't work with him. And not everyone did, in fact. Two of his lovers, including El Hadi Ben Salim, who's in this, they hung themselves. Another made three attempts, but she was unsuccessful. It was constant turmoil, it sounds like. He was charismatic, but abusive. He seemed to actively court controversy and disapproval from the press. I don't know that I would say past a certain young age that he ever had it under control. Especially toward the end when his nose never stopped bleeding and he never left his room. But he managed to wring an extraordinary amount of finished, released, and groundbreaking work out of those relatively few years. With this type of personality, there's often that whirlwind of creativity, a lot of ideas, but it's unsustainable and those things never make it to the finish line. Not him. Fassbender got things done. And speaking of getting things done, did you get your recommendation done? I did. I chose Rollerball from <laughs> 1975, the year I was born. It's set in 2018, by the way, which I'd forgotten about. Directed by Norman Jewison with James Caan, John Houseman, and Maude Adams. And it is about a future that is controlled by corporations. And we're all just puppets in this world, including the players of Rollerball. And James Caan plays the one who wants out and wants to control his own life. Now, a friend got this for me, I think almost as a joke, and I didn't expect it to love it as much as I do. It's got a great sound design, and there is a lot to be said for personal freedom in the modern and future world. So take that ironic gift. Yeah. So how about you? Did you pick one of the other 20 movies he released that year? No, but it is from that year, and it is all in the family. I chose The Tenderness of Wolves from 1973, and that's directed by Uli Lomel, and it's written by and stars Kurt Robb, both of whom were in this film. It was also produced by Fassbender, and he's in it. There are probably half a dozen performers that transfer from one to the other, so it's definitely that same company over again. This is another true crime connection for me, this time being based on the crimes of the German serial killer and cannibal Fritz Harman, who used his position as a government inspector to prey upon young boys. Parts of Fritz Long's M were also modeled on Harman's life, and it's one of Germany's most famous cases. Probably one in 1A, he and Peter Curtin. But with Harman, in the shadow of the war, he raped, mutilated, and murdered at least... 24 young men, likely more, likely 30 to 40. And like Fassbender's films, there is an oddness and discomfort to this that makes it very distinctive. It's easily the best thing Uli Lomel ever made. What was that last thing that we saw together of his? Revenge of the Stolen Stars with Klaus Kinski at Savage Gold? And his wife's in it? Yeah, it's not great. No. Kinski is so drunk that his eyes are constantly crossing. He came back to this type of true crime material much later, starting in 2005. He made about a dozen serial killer bios over the course of about 10 years. None of them hold a candle to this, though. This is Grand Guignol Theater, I feel like, where those are straight-to-video titles you buy at the gas station. It's not as lurid as you might imagine from this crew. There is one distinctly shocking scene in the middle that I think is just enough. It's much more artful than you would think. And it's repulsive, I feel like, in the way that real cases are. When you get right down to it, it's just infuriating that such a pathetic, insignificant creep can have such a devastating effect on the world. And it really is a compelling conundrum to ponder. So once again, that's two great recommendations, Rollerball and The Tenderness of Wolves. And that brings us to the end of episode 127. If what we do here is valuable to you and you would like to support that, 
We would certainly love for you to check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash magic lantern. The $5 a month level gets you access to a big backlog of bonus episodes, and those come out on the Mondays alternating with regular episodes, so you never have to go a week without new Magic Lantern in your life. If you would just like to get in touch with us, you can reach us via email at magiclanternpodcast at gmail.com. We are on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Just search for Magic Lantern Podcast on any of those platforms. We are on Twitter, at Lantern underscore cast, and I just wanted to take a second to say thanks to everyone who has shared the show or given us feedback since last time. Our friend Doug McCambridge over at the Good Times Great Movies podcast, Laura Cannon and the Fatal Films podcast, Drew Tavendale and the Fine Gentleman at Fuds on Film, Andy Wolverton, Keith Rich, Brian Sauer, and Leanne Kubich. If you're sharing the show or talking about us, please make sure to tag us so that we can say thanks. We are on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, just about anywhere you get your podcasts, you can find us. If you'd like to leave us a rating or review via any of those services, we would certainly appreciate that. And finally, you can find all of our episodes, including supplemental material at the website, magiclanternpodcast.com. And thank you for listening to the Magic Lantern Podcast. <laughs>